Albert Allen Bartlett, here's the challenge. Albert Allen Bartlett once said that the, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. The challenge for us is that we as humans are not used to exponential trends because the observable universe, the world around us, is largely linear. It's how we are thinking. Here's a very interesting, simple example for you where you get this really wrong. Um, so you take this dashingly uh, good-looking young guy, um, by the way, never ever have your parents put you into a, into like a, uh, you know, a knitted jacket like this, it's really ugly. But this dashingly good-looking young guy who had hair at one point, um, when he was eight years old, read a book by Albert Allen Bartlett. And he read about exponential trends. So he went to his parents and said, you know, the allowance you give me every week, all I'm asking for is I just want one penny a week. One penny a week. But I want you to double it every week. And my parents were like, oh, this is super cheap, right? This is great. We don't need to give this kid a lot of money. Because what they were doing is they were thinking linearly, right? And lo and behold, if you do this, if you do this for one month, this is four weeks, right? And we're doubling. We go from one, I get one penny in the first week, two pennies in the second week, four pennies, and then eight pennies. At the end of the first month, my parents gave me 16 cent. It's nothing, right? Then we took this further and we said, okay, so how does this look like after three months? Well, after three months, my parents paid me $40. Still tiny amounts of money, right? But now it gets interesting because now we're coming into what is called the end of the first half. So after half a year, my parents needed to sell their house because they had to pay me $761,000. But here it gets interesting. In exponential trends, there's something we call the second half. In this case, when the summer was over, the pain for my parents began. Now make a choice. I just want to have you do a guess. At the end of one year, how much money did my parents need to pay me? Again, we started out with one penny, and we did this for 52 weeks. This is not a long time. 52 weeks, just one year. How much money did my parents have to pay me? One million dollars? A thousand billion? They had to pay me 45 trillion US dollars. 45 trillion US dollars is the combined GDP of these seven nations, the seven largest industrial nations on the planet. That's what exponential trends do to you. And more importantly, you need to understand that exponential trends have this thing which is called the second half, where the numbers get just staggeringly big. And in a lot of technologies, we're starting to get into the second half. This is important to understand that the world will look so dramatically different tomorrow than it does look today. Here's the challenge. Exponential, technology moves on an exponential like, way. Our thinking is linearly. So in this, in this chart, there's three interesting parts. Part number one is this here, what we call disappointment. Because you want technology to be better in the beginning, but it's really not that great. Right? Remember, the first month, I only made 16 cents. You can't buy anything for 16 cents. If you have ever seen Google Glass, anyone has played with Google Glass? Okay, perfect. So if you've seen Google Glass, it's a perfect example. I was at Google when we released Google Glass. And I can tell you, Google Glass is too expensive. The battery life is terrible. It only has about two hours of battery life. The features are really mediocre. It doesn't do a lot and you look like an idiot. So the problem is you're disappointed. Now the challenge with technology is when you're disappointed, a lot of people dismiss it. They don't see it. And then you get to this iPhone moment. This is 10 years ago. Steve Jobs gets on stage and shows you the iPhone for the first time. He does this like, here's one more thing. And this moment is the moment when you realize a phone isn't a phone anymore. A phone is a mini computer. And a phone doesn't have buttons anymore. A phone has glass. And everything changes. And within three years, you get into chaos and amazement, where you can't keep up with the change we're seeing in the world anymore. This is what Nokia experienced. Three years after the iPhone, Nokia was the number one phone in the world. Nokia was gone. The challenge is if we're staying on this line, if we're staying on this thing, this is your path to doom. This is where we fail. The challenge is what we are doing today is we're looking for better ideas. Whereas in reality, what we should do is we should look for more ideas. And I want to teach you a methodology, a way of thinking, a way of running your company, how you get to more ideas, which will lead to better outcomes. And calling this collaborative innovation. 
It starts with competitions, go to, goes over crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, open platforms, and ultimately open source. We'll talk about each of those. Let's start with competitions. The idea be behind a competition is you have a problem, and instead of trying to solve this problem internally, what you do is you go to a community and you say, please, dear community, solve this problem for me, and you've got a price money at the end of it, or you know, some form of price. So you tap into the collective wisdom, the power of people, to solve for your problem. Here's where this played out interestingly. So I want to talk about NASA. NASA has an interesting challenge, which is this here. Uh, this is the sun, and on the sun you've got these things which are called solar flares. They're basically eruptions on the sun. And the challenge with a solar flare is, when you have a solar flare, and the solar flare is uh, very powerful, which happens every couple of years, it emits a lot of radioactivity into the space. If you happen to fly, if you happen to um, have the radioactivity hit the Earth, and you fly a satellite through it, your satellite is, is dead. It burns off. If you happen to be on the ISS as an astronaut, and the ISS flies through it, you're dead. So it's a real problem. You need to know when these things happen so that you can move your assets out of the way. Right? So if you're a satellite company, you want to know when these things happen so you can move your satellite out of the way. It's important. So NASA tried this to figure out, like it's a little bit like weather, just like, you know, to tell you when it's raining. So NASA tried this for 35 years. 35 years of the smartest people on the planet inside of NASA working on this. And they came out with, we didn't find a method to predict a solar particle event. They could not. So the best they could do is they observed the sun, and when they see it happening, you have a few hours until the radiation hits the Earth. So what you do is you do this like panic move, and you move your assets out of, this, out of the way, which is really hard if, you happen, if your asset is called the International Space Station because that thing is ginormous. So it's a really big problem. So NASA had this idea, said like, what if we could ask someone, like do a competition around this, see if someone else comes up with this idea. So they started a competition, and they worked with Karim Lakhani, the gentleman I mentioned earlier. And what they found is, in this competition, after just a couple of months, so the competition ran for about three months, they found an entry into the competition where they could detect with eight hours in advance and 85% accuracy these solar particle events. What's interesting is this here. This is an important, important part about competitions, what is called the marginal entry. What you find over and over again in competitions is that the solutions don't come from the experts. Because the experts, they all see the world in the same way. In this case, the solution came from someone who was a statistician, like a mathematician. And he just looked at the data. He had no idea about solar particle. He, he doesn't even understand the physics behind it. But he looked at the data and said, wow, there's a weird pattern. And if we are like putting this data together, we can create an algorithm which creates this outcome. Now, here's the interesting thing. NASA tried this for 35 years. They spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on it. Have a good guess of how much NASA paid for this. So again, this is a competition. They went out to their community and said, hey, help us solve this problem. And the community rallied, and NASA said, that's great. So total price to NASA, $35,000. That's the power of tapping into the collective wisdom of the crowd, of other people. Crowdsourcing is, is a little bit more creative. Crowdsourcing is this idea of saying, I have a problem, and instead of like, setting it up as a single competition, I'm putting this problem out into the world and say, let's bring the creative juices of all of us together, and we co-create, we co-create this problem. Anyone familiar with these guys, Doritos? Part of PepsiCo, the worst potato chip on the planet. Very, very tasty, very bad for your waistline. Tastes really great, it's a good product. So Doritos is a mass market consumer product. And if you know anything about mass market consumer products in the US, the biggest marketing bar none is the Super Bowl. And the way the Super Bowl works is very simple. You buy advertising time, which costs you millions of dollars. You go to the best advertising agency you possibly can find. They work on an incredibly clever idea, which costs you millions of dollars. They keep this super quiet, because it's the big secret. 
And then on Super Bowl day, you air your Super Bowl ad. The Super Bowl is important out of two reasons. One, it's one of the most watched sports events in the world. Secondly, so a lot of people see your stuff. Secondly, the Super Bowl has a tradition of advertising. And the Super Bowl is a little bit like the Oscars in advertising. So there is a, um, a public vote, which was the funniest, the coolest ad. And the funniest and coolest ad then gets, you know, ranked, and the top one, two, whatever, three ads, they get aired over and over again for free because they get picked up by the media and people talk about it. So it's really important to get the Super Bowl right. What the guys from Doritos did was they thought differently. They said, how is it that we believe that the smartest people work at this particular agency? That doesn't make sense somehow. So we do this thing 10 years ago. They said, you know what? Let's crash the Super Bowl. Let's do this differently. We go to our community. Again, these are Dorito-eating people, right? It's not like the advertising community. Dorito-eating people and said, co-create with us. Create an advertisement for us for the Super Bowl. And of course, all their, uh, their ad inter uh, ad, the ad agency first said, like, this is stupid. Don't do it because they saw their money going away, of course. But also, the, all the executives said, like, you're crazy. Like, how do you think that the, the world's, like, community, like, people who eat Doritos have good ideas? What do you think about that? But the team prevailed. They said, like, well, let's try this. Let's crowdsource Dorito ads. They got 4,000 entries. 4,000 people. And this an entry is not just, like, you needed to write a single line, like, oh, it would be funny if. You needed to write a full storyboard with visuals and everything. So they get 4,000 people to submit this. Now, the question is, how do you figure out which one is the best one? So they said again, you know, why don't we ask the community? Because they will know best. So they put all the ads on, on a video site and had people vote on them. Again, this is crazy. You keep your Super Bowl ad silent and secret. It's the big unreal. They were like, no, just like pick it. 4,000 ads. They spent two and a half million dollars total on this, which is about a fourth of what you normally spend on a Super Bowl ad, at least. They got 60, 60, uh, sorry, 36 million US dollars in free publicity because everybody was like, this is crazy, it's amazing. So even if nothing would have happened, they would have had a massive success just by having pub free publicity. And yet, they won. That year, they knocked off Budweiser's 10 years running streak. Budweiser was winning the Super Bowl ad for 10 years in a row. And the reason for that is when you've ever seen a Budweiser ad, it has a horse and a dog in it. Of course it wins. So this ad won. They've since repeated this for the last 10 years. And every year, with the same effort, the same approach, they've come into the top 10, often into the top three of the spots in the Super Bowl. So that's the power of the crowd. Never underestimate the crowd. So I want to talk about crowdfunding. The idea behind crowdfunding is you take your product or your service and you go to, the, to your consumers, your customers, your crowd, and you say, help us fund this project. So instead of going to a bank or a venture capitalist to get money, produce the product, what you do is you go out into the community and you say, help us fund this project. This originally came out of the art community. So someone wanted to write a new book or create a new record. So they went into the arts community to their fans and said, if you give me some money, I am going to produce this book. Crowdfunding now is actually really interesting. And I want to show you an interesting example. Any of you uh, uh, here is a beekeeper. Anyone is like keeping bees? Every once in a while, I find a beekeeper. It's always a beekeeper. Okay. So there's a company called Flow. And what Flow did is, if you know anything about beekeeping, it looks like this. So if you, uh, if you have bees, um, uh, you need to pull out these, uh, these layers, and you like, need to smoke the bees out, and you scrape off the honey. It's a really involved process. Um, and it's really hard, right? Like you get stung, and it's, like, it's unpleasant for the bees, etc. So there's a father and a son. They're amateur beekeepers. And they come up with this brilliant idea. They built, over about 10 years, a beekeeping machine, which looks like this here. So it's this weird thing where like, the bees fly in, 
And then similar to a, uh, a beer tap, you just put the glass underneath it, you pull the tap and like it extracts the, the honey. You don't need to smoke out the bees, it's phenomenal. So how do you bring a product like this to market? Back in the old days, what you would do is you would go to your bank and you say, I want to create a beekeeping thing. And your bank would say, sure, of course. Then you go to your friends and family and you say, I want to create this, can you give me some money? And because your friends and family love you, they give you $10,000 and you build this thing and you start selling it to a few people, then you make some more money and you sell it to a few people, etc. What these guys did, they said, you know what, let's do this differently. We will take this and we bring it to a company called Indiegogo. Indiegogo is a, a platform for crowdfunding. And they started a crowdfunding campaign. And again, like the way crowdfunding works is, you put up your product and you say, you do basically pre-orders. You say, here's my goal, I need to raise $70,000. If I raise $70,000, I'm going to produce this. And you make a pre-order. So have a wild guess. This is beekeeping, just to remind you. This is a tiny little niche. There's one beekeeper in this whole room. So have a guess how many people committed money to this fundraiser. How much money have they raised? So $70,000 is, by the way, when I saw this first, I saw it when it came out, right? I was like, $70,000 for beekeeping? Are you crazy? And by the way, one of these machines cost about $300 or so. So guess how much money they raised. Any guesses? 500,000? Are you crazy? Come on, it's beekeeping. I mean, you're just like, what? This is not exponential. They raised $13 million. Wow. Because what happened is that the community of beekeepers around the world found this thing and rallied around it and said, we want to have this thing. It's brilliant. So there's a really interesting way to think about how do you bring a product to market? I've been working with Sony, Sony Corporation in Japan, and they're producing, in, in the meantime, they're producing when they produce new products and they're not sure about the product. So they produce, for example, a watch, uh, which is called the, uh, by the way, Kez watch. So you should, you should like, totally get the watch. Anyway, it's called the Kez watch. And it's a beautiful little watch. It's very niche. And what they did is they put it on a crowdfunding platform to see if people would buy it. They don't, didn't even put the Sony brand on it. They just said, like, here's a cool watch. And we run this under a company, uh, under a name of Kez. Uh, Fez, sorry, Fez watch. Fez watch. And we see if someone buys it. They sold a couple million of those, and then they started producing them. So interesting thing about crowdfunding is it's already bigger than venture capital. Last year, crowdfunding was 34 billion US dollars. Venture capital in Silicon Valley is only about 25 billion US dollars. It's a massive, massive opportunity for you to bring a new product to market, either as a small independent, but increasingly as a big company. So let's talk about open platforms. So we're taking this even further. The idea of open platforms is I use my product or my service as something other people can build on it. If you're in the software industry, you know something called APIs, Application Program Interfaces. The idea is I have a platform, I have a software product, and other people can build on top of this. Um, if you're familiar with Salesforce, it's a really good example. Salesforce is a customer relationship management software, and they allow other people to plug into it and build on top of it. Um, Facebook is another example where you can um, play games inside of Facebook, so Facebook becomes a platform. I want to show you where platforms actually happen in the real world. So software is obvious, but they happen in the real world. It's really fascinating to see. And I want to talk about IKEA. So you are blessed that you don't have IKEA here. IKEA makes this really beautiful, uh, fun furniture. The challenge with that furniture is they sell you the furniture unassembled. So you basically get a, a whole box of like stuff and then a really complex manual to like build your stuff with it, um, which a lot of people hate. Now something interesting happened. Because you get a box of stuff, there's a community now of people saying, oh, we hack this stuff. We take this and we turn it into something different. So say, for example, I take a shelf, and I take a table plate, and I take this other thing, and I create this new, amazing, um, uh, height-adjustable uh, desk out of it. So these people organize themselves on a site called IKEA Hackers. 
On IKEA Hackers, you will find thousands upon thousands of detailed instructions on how you can buy this thing and this thing from IKEA and create something completely new. This has also become total mainstream. There's a, a, a magazine and a site in the US called Good Housekeeping, which is the premier interior design magazine. They talk about this IKEA hacking. So what does IKEA do? First, they sue them because they're like, you're misusing our trademark. The second is they sue them because they're afraid, right? There's product liability. And I met the, the inno head of innovation from IKEA when they started suing them. He was in my program at the EP, and I was yelling at him. I was like, you are so stupid. You have a platform. This is crazy. This is the best thing which can happen to you. Because what people do is they take your stuff, and they're producing new products, which A, you could have never dreamt of, and B, which probably are so niche so small, that you would never produce them because it doesn't make economic sense for you, but there is a community for it. So what they do is they embrace it. So they go out now and sell you individual parts. They're like, oh, okay, so our stuff is more like Lego. So we'll sell you parts, build your own stuff. It's a really interesting way to think about how can you take a physical product and turn it into a platform, allow people to build on it, create variations of your product which you could never even dream about, and allow them to produce products in quantities which are so small that you would never even think about building. Now we're taking it all the way to the extreme. Open source comes out of the software movement. And the idea of open source is I give you the blueprints to my software. I give you the, all the software. And I just let you do whatever you want to do with it. And it comes out of the hacker ethos of the 60s and 70s, when computers were still used not by corporations, but by you know, people in universities. So I wrote like a, a piece of software which solved a problem. And instead of just keeping it for myself, I gave it to other people. I said. You can use this. And by the way, here's the, blue, the blueprint to it, the source code, so you can modify it. And what happened is a community started to form and a codex formed where people said, if I'm doing this and I find a problem, a bug in the software, I send it back to the original author so that everybody benefits from my findings. If I make an improvement, I'm sending it back to the original author so everybody can, can um, profit from it. This leads to a very vibrant ecosystem. The most used server operating system today is a software called Linux, which is completely open source. It's a whole bunch of people who say, you know what, we want to make this happen. And it displaced Microsoft Windows as the uh, dominant server operating system. I want to give you a different example. This is interesting. WordPress. Anyone has heard of WordPress? A few people, right? So WordPress is what is called a content management system. So WordPress is a thing, a software you use to create beautiful looking websites. WordPress has a really interesting story. The backstory is this. In 2001, uh, blogging became popular. So blogging is this like, you know, people writing, you know, what they had for breakfast basically on like a website. So a bit like Twitter today, uh, minus the US president, of course. Um, so it became very popular for people to like, put this stuff on the internet. So a gentleman wrote a software called B2, which allowed him to write blogs. And then he was thinking about, hey, if it's useful for me, why don't I give it to the community and let other people work with this? So this is 2001, and a pretty vibrant community of people evolved around this, using his software, making some modifications, making it a little bit better. In 2003, the original author said, you know, it's not my business. I don't care about this stuff all that much anymore. I just abandon it. I don't want to do this anymore. And these two guys, Matt Malweck and Mike Little, picked it up and said, because we have the blueprint, we can, do, we can modify it, right? So 2003, they picked this up, and they create WordPress out of it. 2004, they relaunched the product as WordPress. Now, WordPress is a really interesting piece of software today. Again, the whole software is free to use. You can download the source code. You can make your own modifications. It's all there. In 2016, last year, WordPress powered 26% of the web. Every fourth website on this planet, which you visit, runs on WordPress. It is by far the most influential piece of software ever being written, likely. It also is huge. 
It's available in 56 languages, of which the original WordPress team produces one. The rest is done by volunteers. They say, I want to have WordPress in Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, so they write it in Brazilian Portuguese. And then they make it available to the whole community, right? So it's a community service. There's 45,000 plugins. These are pieces of software which make WordPress better at what it does or add specific functionality. Again, a lot of these free to the community. WordPress has 175 million users. Compare this with about 250 million users for the largest website in the world, which is Google. But Google achieves this goal with 70,000 employees. WordPress has 543 employees. It's tiny. But it's also good business. WordPress raised 190 million US dollars in equity funding. Now the question becomes, how does this actually work as a business model, right? It's interesting because you give your stuff away. How can you even run a business on this? Well, I can tell you it's easy. What they do is they sell you services. They say, here's the software, and take it and do whatever you want. But if you want to host this on our, our specialized servers, you pay us a little fee. If you want us to create some special version for you, you pay us a little fee. There's a similar business model with a company called Red Hat. They are distributing Linux, the operating system. Again, Linux is free. You can just download it. You can go to the Red Hat website and download Linux and install it for yourself. Red Hat is a $1 billion profit, not revenue, profit business. The reason why they make a billion dollars in profit is because they found an interesting hack. They say, here's the software for free, but you pay us some money for the services. You pay us for the privilege that there's someone doing customer support for you. It's a really weird world. You can build really interesting businesses on top of open source. So here's your how-to. The first, the first point you need to become clear about is the what question. What do you actually want to achieve? So a lot of people I meet, when they come to me and say, I want to be open, I want to do open source, or I want to do crowdsourcing. When I ask them, what do you actually want to achieve? They don't know. They're like, oh, I heard it's cool. I'm like, that's not good enough a reason. There's very specific reasons why you want to do something in the open. There's clearly good reasons why you want to do something in, the, in a closed ecosystem. Say, for example, uh, if you work in very sp with very specific intellectual property, which is very valuable to you, of course you don't give your intellectual property to the world, right? That makes sense. So the first question you really need to think hard and deeply about is what do you want to achieve? Once you have that, think about how. And the how is the question of what mechanism are you using? I showed you five mechanisms, anything from competitions to crowdsourcing to crowdfunding, to platforms and open source. There's many others in between there. But figure out what is the mechanism you want to start with. In particular, if you're in an established company, this whole open thing is pretty scary. Right? Because you go to, come to people and say, oh, give all your stuff away and like, involve the community in. This is crazy. Like, people will look at you like, you're nuts. So I suggest start small and start the least involved version. So instead of going and saying, we open source everything tomorrow, probably start out and say, okay, let's pick a particular problem and start with a competition. You know, or a crowdsourcing or crowdfunding campaign around a very specific problem. You need to become super clear about the why. And the why is not your why. The why is why should they care? Why should I care about your stuff? If you heard about, uh, if you heard Salim Ismail ever speak, he talks about the idea of the massive transformative purpose. You need to give me something I can believe in as a, as a customer, as a contributor. You need to give something I can rally behind, which is important to me. If you come to me and say, help us co-create this thing so we can sell a few more products, like, why should I care? But if you come to me and you say, hey, let's crash the Super Bowl, I'm like, Hell yeah, let's crash the Super Bowl, that's awesome. When I, was, I worked at Mozilla, the Firefox web browser, when we built Firefox, we were 20 people. We were competing with the largest software company on the planet, Microsoft. Microsoft had 1,200 people building Internet Explorer. We were 20. What we did is we went to our community and we said, let's fight back, and let's win back the web. The web is ours to be taken. And we had thousands of developers who came to us and said, this is awesome, I want to be part of it. So you need to give me a reason why I should care. And it needs to have purpose. Karim Lakhani again did some really interesting research on why people care. And he found 
the most important reasons why people care in this order is, first of all, they have an itch to scratch. So they want to solve the problem for themselves. The reason why people contribute to open source is because they want to solve the problem for themselves first. They love the creative process. It's a way for them to express themselves, to do something which is bigger than they are. They have a sense of belonging. I'm part of a community. Like this, is, like, this is my tribe. I work with people I care about. There's an opportunity for me to learn. And lastly, it is reputation building. I can guarantee you, the guy who did that spot you saw earlier from Doritos, that guy now has a very high-paid job in advertising. Of course, because he's brilliant, right? So he created a, an interesting reputation. Once you have all that together, you need to now engage with your customer. And when we talk about engaging, the really important thing to understand is your customer is not your customer. Your customer is a citizen. That changes fundamentally your relationship. It's not we are here and they are there. You're together with them. You're citizens. You are the mayor, the elected mayor. So you need to interact with them differently. You need to create a system of meritocracy, which means that not your opinion matters because you're the person who gets paid or who has got the highest title. The opinion of the person who's got the best insight matters. You have to become a learning organization. Understand that this, this, this idea of going to open is incredibly rich, incredibly powerful, and, and changes the way you will do business. But you have to allow for your organization to learn. It's a very new way of thinking. So, Allow yourself some time, be gentle on yourself, and iterate. When you go open, your culture changes. And it's a little bit like the genie in the bottle. Once you open the bottle, you will never ever be able to turn that back. Once you go open, your people will change the way they think about the market, they think about the customer, they think about the company, they think about managing. Everything changes. You cannot get this back. So be careful about this. The second one is really important. This is when you don't go open, but your competition does. I can show you example after example after example. If you're in a market where your comp competition goes open, you're toast. So I encourage you to think about in your businesses where you have challenges today, where you need to compete and, and um, innovate, to think about how do you do this in an open manner.